Um, and yeah, so today it's my pleasure to have Tom and Maggie Copeland join us. Uh, I guess um, Maggie will be leading the presentation. So Maggie's an adjunct professor at NYU Tandon Department of Finance and Risk Engineering. And um, during her long career, she's been a trader and hedge fund manager for long short, market neutral and long only funds. She was a hedge fund portfolio manager and trader at Paloma Securities and Solomon Smith Barney, a, v a VP of Pro Prop Trading at NatWest Securities, Prop Trader at Bear Stearns, a senior risk manager at Fidelity, and a partner portfolio manager at Roland Ross Asset Management. That is a long career. So she was also the first woman to receive a PhD in finance uh, from UCLA, has publications in Financial Analyst Journal, Financial Management, Journal of Portfolio Management, and she's told me this the paper that she's presenting today is also already accepted for publication. Her professional public speeches include DE Shaw Hedge Fund Conference, Dow Jones Global Conference, and the International Risk Management Conference. And I should add that she welcomes uh, questions during um, her talk today. So just unmute yourself and ask away. Maggie, why don't you take it away? Okay, thank you. <laughs> So uh, this is the end. Uh, this is not the end of talk. Um, happy April 1st. Uh, we are talking about the end of the company. Okay, the first I'd like to thank Peter and my son and a few people who participate in the last late, uh, late May last year. We have a kind of a interesting um, conference party um, and we discuss a lot of different subjects, including some of the uh, stuff about firm mortality. And so the title of this paper, there are two papers I'm going to discuss. Uh, in addition to that, I'd like to also talk a little bit about uh, this type of application in academic. Okay, uh, the following two paper I, uh, already submit a, have been a step by both by general portfolio management and both paper I work uh, during last summer with the two, two of my students. Okay, the first paper, which is the main paper here, is a tale of two tale, mortality, size, volatility, and EPU. EPU is economic policy uncertainty. And this paper has been a step. Um, and the author is me and Tom. And uh, Xi Tong Lao, he is my student for last year. And after school finished, he, he wanted to work with me for some research. And so this is the one of the paper we work together. And the second paper, which had been published, also it was working uh, during summer last year, called Implied Mortality for the Firm. And the market tell the tale. And the paper was very quick, accept and then published uh, already in the February 2021 General Portfolio Management. Uh, people interested, you can take a look at that paper. The same thing is uh, Tom, me, and then another one of my still good students, uh, Coda. <clears throat> So uh, I tend to publish a lot of paper in the more of a general portfolio management or financial analyst. And I'm really interested in VIX and also assets allocation, tilting the type of uh, uh, asset. And in the 2016, I published a paper called VIX First Size. And I really respect Steve Ross, uh, not because of, not only because of his mathematics skill, but also his insight for a lot of uh, a paper and uh, idea. And so usually quite prior to he pass away, every time I have a paper, I always send to him comment. And he really like one of my other paper is FX hedging. I, I will talk a little bit about it. Uh, but when I send this paper, Big Bird Size, to Steve, and uh, Steve asked me a question, why volatility matters? And usually when I give Steve a paper, he will get back to me in you know, a day or two. And this usually is very long comment, but this time he only give me one sentence, 
why volatility matter. So this paper basically say uh, big is the more price factor compared to size. It's more significant than size. So the question I like to ask the audience is, uh, why does volatility no matter, like Steve say, and when does volatility matter? No comment. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I'll jump in. Uh, okay. Volatility matters if you're long a variant swap because <laughs> it's uh, part of what you're going to get. Um, so, um, and probably, I'm guessing the volatility not mattering is maybe a statement that something like covariance or beta <laughs> matters more than volatility. You think maybe that's what he was getting at? Yeah, I think that's uh, getting the, in the portfolio theory, if you have N, go to infinity, volatility go wipe out. So that's why he said volatility doesn't matter. And Peter is right. Peter used much more complicated way to say it, but I'm going to use a, a, a simple way to say this, why volatility matter, okay. Um, people know I live in the, uh, I need to get this work. Uh, we live in La Jolla, okay, and uh, one thing nice about La Jolla is uh, there is a beautiful water beach. And you can see, if you think about wave, like a volatility. And so wave come in, wave go, okay? And so you can use that similarity as wave, like a volatility. So if wave come in, water come in and water go, then volatility doesn't matter. Okay, but there is one case volatility matter. This is a beautiful sidewalk, which we go every day. Um, in the left side is a low, low tide and the right side is a high tide. And so usually, you know, the boat was beautiful everybody walk and bike, but when the high tide come in, and there is a barrier wall here, okay. When the high tide come in, okay, and water trap in this, this area, it cannot go out. Okay, so well, it doesn't matter as long as there is no this barrier, water going coming and water go. Okay, but what it matter is when there's a barrier, water coming and water trap, water cannot go out. Okay. Okay, uh, Maggie, one small thing. I, I wonder if you could um, switch to slideshow so we could see the whole um, the slides a bit better. Because um, right now, um, you, you know, so you, you just click on slideshow at the top. Yes. So what, what should I do? Um, there's a, I was thinking- oh, New slides. No. no slideshow. So just at the top, um, file home, insert, draw, design, transitions, animations, slideshow. Okay. <clears throat> um, so just trying to make the slides bigger. Oh. Yeah. Thank you, Kirsten. All right. It's not that important. It's okay. I, I know <laughs> what you're talking about. I did that in the classes to a student asked me that, but I forgot where they are. Oh, it's, like it's at the top, like, so, um, you know, at the very top of your slide, there's all these commands like file, home, insert. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. That, there it is. Okay, yeah. so, so that's it. Keep going to the right, to the slide right. From here, the slide from here. Yeah, the right, so right there, slideshow. Okay, yeah. great. And then I guess from current slide, so, so second from the left, from current slide. From yeah. Current slide. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So what I need to do next? Oh, just hit page down or to go to the next slide. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. So basically, uh, okay, good. So, so what's in a math term? Okay. Since this is a financial engineer class, I will put a little bit math here. Okay. So in the, what's the mathematical term for this type of question? And what's optimization term for this type of question? Are you asking us? 
<laughs> yeah, I, I, I like a more of a feedback type of otherwise. Okay. I... All right, for math term, I think I can do that one. That would be okay. like, uh, so plus on arrival of an event such as death. Absorption <laughs> is a state of which you got absorbed. Okay. Okay, absorbing state. Okay, fine. Yeah, and then optimization is a boundary condition. So this type of mortality, if you have this exist, then this uh, volatility become a, a price factor. So there is a several application of this type of question. Okay, why is uh, actually my first paper, first try for my thesis was this type of question too, but my answer come out to complicate big rather than like. So it's called about convertible bond. Okay. And then second application, which uh, is FX hedging, Tom and me published in 1999, and we, we present in the UCLA Commodity Hedging uh, Conference. And the result, I think many people like, it. even Merton Miller like the, the result. Okay, basically what we do is we use the same kind of idea. Okay, so what you do is when you, this is also apply for commodity hedging. So when you have a, a company who is international and if they don't hedge the currency, it could resolve the bankruptcy, okay? So what we do is uh, the cost, the, uh, the benefit of hedging is avoid the bankruptcy and the cost was the hedging cost. So we use that kind of, we use the case process to find out the optimal solution for this kind of hedging problem. And this apply for, uh, commodity hedging like airline too, airline hedging the oil. And the second paper we did was much more current is the 2017. There's a long period of time I didn't publish it because I was so busy in my trading. And it's valuation. And the same type of argument was in general, the most of the valuation like a DCF and golden growth model is all assume, assume perpetual. And so in this paper, we have, we've used a uh, stochastic process and then find out what's the time which company will go bankrupt and then similar the formula very similar fx hedging and third type of application which i really like this paper is by sandy grossman and joe chow and what they do is they find i mean you know in the hedge fund uh maximum drawdown is very important uh i got funding a few times from large fund or fund and the one or contract always specify how much maximum drawdown you, you can suffer before you got kicked out. Okay. And so maximum drawdown usually is specified in the contract. And so the for a hedge fund, otherwise it would like a free option to a portfolio manager or trader. So this kind of if you have a specified uh, maximum drawdown, then for when you create your portfolio in optimization, then that is a, become a one of boundary condition you need to uh, satisfy. <laughs> and in general, that's all kind of relate to the volatility covariance type of a constraint. But all these three application is the similar idea of um, all relate to the mortality and then the two tail of the firm. Okay. So, uh, let's continue doing this. So we start talking about, I said something about the continued value. Continued value usually is being company value after certain year. And this slide is from uh, Tom's book. And we're talking about the, if you use cash flow to DCF, uh, in the five year, the value only come about 20%. So that's mean 80% of the value is in continuous value. And then if you look at 10 year company, you use DCF, it's a count about 40%. So that's mean 60% of company value is in continuous value. And you turn around to see this picture is if a company die in five years, the DCF, 80% of DCF value will be gone. So if a company die or end in the 10 year, then your 60% of the DCF value is gone, okay? So I'm a trader, and so I need to talk about this uh, trading implication, okay? I trade many, many strategies, but these three are much more effect 
by the uh, tail risk. Okay. So momentum, momentum usually is very um, powerful trading strategy for most of trader. And but one of problem momentum is that sometimes can have a huge drawdown. And the usual drawdown we call momentum crash. And momentum crash usually happen here when uh, usually happen after crisis, not during the crisis. Is a after crisis when market start to recover and in the short side, not in the long side, in the short side. And I think uh, all of you probably heard about GameStop, and those are exactly what happened for momentum crash. It's a short side got short squeeze. And I think Ken Daniel have a paper that looking at the 1920 and many times, this always happened. And then when momentum crash, it's really um, put my bell stem old boss and drop like a rock, okay? So second uh, strategy I'm talking about is a mean reverting. Mean reverting usually is a short-term mean reverting strategy. And the same thing, the only thing is the opposite. Mean reverting tend to buy the loser and then uh, show the winner. And so when momentum is very strong, so you can continue buying something, keep on losing the money. And so basically one thing called the value trap and people keep on buying red and company going like uh, in the uh, 2019, you know, community, uh, no, 2009. The com commodity meltdown, uh, a lot of mean reverting didn't do well. Is because you keep on buying co uh, company going down the uh, go to the bankruptcy type of company, and the third thing is valuation, which Tom and me we man managing for many years, and uh, we quantify valuation such that we can run a company uh, in two seconds. But the biggest problem we have is in two tail. And that's one of the reasons we, we work on this paper. In general, the tail risk is a very high for valuation because two reasons is, first of all, we are quantified. So everything all use computerized to calculate all the value. And two type of risk based the valuation. One is uh, the company got acquired. Okay, so we didn't count on the potential got acquired possibility. And then another thing is the company go bankrupt. So we keep on buying because we saw it's cheap, but didn't estimate the tail risk or the tail got cut off the part of value. So valuation is, is very severe, suffer for the this two tail risk. Uh, if you just quantify, of course, if uh, analysts which know valuation and they may be able to avoid that, but in our, strategy, this was be the one suffered the most of terrorists. Okay, so in this paper, uh, the first paper I'm going to talk is a tale of two tale. And we use a murder model. Okay, uh, so let me just kind of uh, talk about murder model. Murder in 1974, and he valued stock equity is a call option on value of company and exercise price is the nominal value of a liability. So it's bond. So in general, equity can be as call option on the firm. And equity holder will choose not to repay the firm debt when the value of firm is less than value of outstanding debt. And when value of firm is greater than debt value, the shareholder would choose to prepay, repay. So in our paper, what we did is we think a company as a two call option. And the second call option is like a, a, the a merger model. Uh, and there's a, uh, we look at the one is a, a VC and VP. VC is the current value. So a company value based on current uh, operation, current uh, status and B is that. And so this is the typical Merton uh, valuation for value of the stock. But we add one more and P is a potential value. So a company can exchange current value to another potential value. 
The reason I add this one is more of one tail I talk about is a merger acquisition. And then in a broader view, you can think of this as uh, the uh, like a reoption type of approach. So company, we spread, uh, we separate company value as a two core option. Why this, I call this upside potential call. This is a downside risk call. Okay, so, so downside risk call is like a Merton's valuation. Of course, you can combine these two as a one call option. And then, but then you need a tail jump process to value this. But I split that as a two, so I can you know, kind of discuss this as a two tail. So, uh, so company value can be displaced as these. And this, uh, the first one is upside potential, uh, downside risk. And, <clears throat> and all this value, you can use the exchange option value to price it. Okay. Maggie, quick question. Sure. So I would have expected to hear some kind of weighting of the two calls. Why are they, they, they two full call options? Isn't there some overlap there? Uh, quite overlap because the second one, the first one exercise price is VC. So, so I think I, what David's saying is um, what happens if a company, let's use your merger example. I mean, what if the merger occurs first and then the debt matures after? Like when the underlying um, of the second call be the P after the merger occurred, not VC? No, so what, what you say is a timing, but I have a, in the paper, I have an assumption. VP is greater than VC. And that all holder doesn't participate on the uh, benefit of the exchange offer. The second, uh, first call option. The, the one thing, I mean, I, I understand David probably thinking about pop, I need to assign probability on the CU and CD. That's more what I, I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I understand you. So you think about, but I mean, it could, you can do, I, I originally thought about that, but like uh, there's a W and there, there's a one minus W. And, but then. Well, the reason, the reason I think this is relevant is that you look at, you know, the literature for getting implied risk neutral distributions and it's a popular model to take a mixture of two log normals. And this could be a good um, application for that, I would think. Yeah, uh, but the, the only thing is the CU and CD is no traditional binomial CU, CD. I just put a name there, okay. I, I, yeah, I, I understand why you approach it because I, in the beginning when we model this, we think about that, there's a probability that attached that. But then for some reason, I just give up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think the reason is I assuming v, uh, VP always greater than VC. Yeah, I mean, maybe here's a story that would work. I mean, so so say that um, there's a possibility of, a, of an acquisition in the future. Um, and if it occurs, there's no chance of bankruptcy. Um, so um, so then let's say either, like either the merger occurs before the debt matures and then the benefits from that merger are captured by the first term. Okay, or there's no such merger uh, and then uh, only the second term, you know, Finishes in the money um, if there's bankruptcy, and um, you know then and there's no interaction between the two possibilities <clears throat> is how you would get straight addition. Um, I suppose you still have to probability weight. Yeah, so that's that's okay. That that brings up so yeah, and then you would probably wait for whether or not a merger occurs, and that's what David's saying. Yeah, uh, another thing is uh, yeah. even more complicated. My student mention about the in Chinese, sometimes company um, go to merger because a company almost bankrupt. And then I, I, I say that in my paper actually, is uh, um, some of Ch Chinese have obstacle to, to get a, a register in the stock change. So sometimes company almost bankrupt and they will rather be bought. And then, so really benefit is bond holder, okay, so, but in, in my setting, I didn't say that. So that's the reason I put a VP greater than VC and then bondholder doesn't participate in any um, 
um, any profit from the, the first call. Yeah, so it's like saying there's no bankruptcy if the merger occurs. Yeah, that, that, that's why yeah. I, 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 I try to simplify that. And um, I mean, that's an interesting idea I would think about, but maybe the, the next the other thought I have is you could also say it's almost like a call into put. The, the put being the exercise of the limited liability option in bankruptcy uh, and the call being the call on the upside, you know, due to the, uh, you know, possibility of a merger, for example. Yeah, then you'd, you'd have to add, I think what, um, you're thinking of using put call parity, basically. <laughs> to yeah. swap that, the, the... Well, I'm, I'm trying to separate the two events, right? Because I can, I can find the value of the strangle then, in this case. I'm, I'm trying to make sense out of this in a different way. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sense in, out of this in a different way in that I would think of CD as the value of the firm if the merger doesn't happen. And CU is the marginal in, uh, increase in value if the merger does happen. So that you can add them together. Um, and the first, the, the CU uh, uh, option is gonna be worth zero if VP is less than VC. And if VC is less than V, then they're both zero. All right, so the, yeah. I, I, want, I want the CU to be the marginal value of, of the, the merger and CD being the value of the firm without any merger. Yeah. Suggest that CU be multiplied by some probability then with the merger? Well, I think the Basically. CU has a probability in it. Oh, it's it in it. So it's just, it's it's just embedded. Or... Yeah, because it's a stochastic process. So you have a VP, VC, you know, whether there's a, uh, whether if a VP always, uh, like a, a Stephen say, I mean, if a VP less than VC, this is zero. Well, anyway, that, that I would like that that explanation to work, and if it does, then everybody's happy. And if it doesn't, then then you got to figure out why not. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Uh, my wife just I will came see the on bit. front was my wife, so I better uh, I better find out what's going on. <laughs> okay, so everybody kind of satisfied his answer. He give a good answer, but yeah, probability is a VP VC whether they hit, and then if you do that. Uh, the probability will be in the cough itself. Okay. Okay. So the next thing uh, we we thinking about is if giving that kind of uh, argument. So there is a, a couple of uh, optimal capital structure because Tom always want to do capital <laughs> optimal capital structure. So we would like to know whether if a setting is this kind of setting, what the Kept optimal capital structure can be, okay? So we propose three way. One way is uh, just maximum shareholder. And the second one is uh, maximum uh, shareholder and bondholder. Remember the bond uh, current value and the potential value is the same, okay? And the third one is uh, maximum the uh, current value of the uh, stock and the current value of bond. And the result is very different, okay? And let me say a couple of things. One thing is, uh, so for example, company want to uh, um, take a one project which uh, can benefit uh, a shareholder a lot, like a real option. And then, so the maximum, the first one, and the and second one, third one, the capital, uh, optimal capital structure is very different. Okay, and this is very complicated issue about capital structure and um, I'm, and then also the agency costs, all the stuff. And in my paper, we just uh, kind of touch the point and let people to think about this uh, because have existing of this upside potential, which make the capital structure can be very different. Okay. So what we did is we used quiz tape from 1960 to 2019. And uh, it's interesting is that uh, we take out some of uh, uh, low uh, capitalization stock and we look at the uh, distribution over the time. It's, uh, I was a uh, question about why this is a big jump in the se uh, 70 and then after 2000 coming down. Okay, the so number of stock in the quiz tape, okay? 
So what we did is for, we, we use two factors. Okay, uh, there is one paper, which is my first published paper. Uh, I work with uh, Dick Raw. And what we look at is a look at a uh, mortality table. I think this probably was the one of the discussion uh, Peter talked about in they made that, that party. And so we similar idea, but different approach. Okay, so for each year from uh, 1960 to, to 2018, we use two factor. One is the size, one is the volatility. And then for each year, we use annual data. For each year, for example, in 2000, uh, end of 1999, we formed 10 size portfolio based on end of year size. And then, uh, and then we look forward. And for example, look at uh, in 2000, how many companies in each portfolio disappear. And in the 2002, 2010, and then look at one year, three year, five year, and 10 year based on size and volatility. And then we look at the two different type of mortality. One is favorable. Favorable is a company got merger and exchange. And unfavorable is a company uh, bankrupt or drop. Okay, and then we look at the uh, their mortality and there's favorable and unfavorable because they two tail why is upside potential and unfavorable is a downside risk. So this is a result. <clears throat> this is for size unfavorable and you can tell um, the large cap, the black curve is large cap, red curve is a small cap and it's very volatile. And uh, it's different from a uh, data means paper. We data means paper, we just sum up as one estimate. And here we look at time series. And uh, the result is, uh, is very volatile. Also, it's very interesting. I, I, I check every single point, okay? And so for example, uh, in the 1890s is a, a semi loan crisis. And then there is a, a long-term capital or another Asian Asian crisis, Asian financial crisis. So it's, it it match, and but on another hand, big firm doesn't seem to like move, move so much in the uh, unfavorable mortality, but small firm change a lot. And this one year, this is three year, this is five year, and this is ten year. And if you look carefully, ten year, I mean, here is over seventy percent. Okay, so let's go back to Tom's uh, uh, that slides. So, twenty percent. If you count five year company uh, co company uh, disappear in ten year, that sixty percent of value is gone. So if you use traditional valuation model, you should really take out sixty percent for some of small firm. Okay. Did, um, Maggie, if I, let me ask you this. Did, did you uh, compare these rates uh, to CDS rates, prices or implied probabilities from CDS quotes? Because these numbers are enormous. Yeah, I, I didn't compare that, but the, the only one thing I'm kind of, uh, you know, I used to be a Ken French research assistant. I, I kind of worry about is the quiz tape itself. We uh -huh. did a lot of low cap already and still, I mean, you, you see the quiz table, there is a big jump. Okay. Yeah, quiz table have a big jump in the, uh, here, big jump in the number of firm. And in our paper, we, uh, you know, original price uh, data is even worse. And, but we trim some of very illegal stock and still come out that, but I did not compare with CDS. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason I, I did this paper is, uh, you know, the 87 did and me published one paper, we did similar, but except we use, we, we look at the, like one year we will have one, one observation. And I always worry about, uh, concern about, uh, thinking about this, uh, what's the, there's a size effect, okay. 
I I never believe small frame is bad. So that that's the one reason I do this paper. <laughs> okay. So let's go to favor one. Favor one is more uh, like a, they cross, okay? And in some way, the large firm actually do better than small firm. So favor one, you want a high probability. And on favor one, you want a low uh, probability, okay? And this is uh, for volatility. Volatility is less, the gap a little bit smaller, but size is most significant. And it's kind of consistent with the earlier uh, empirical work we have uh, with the thick rule of that paper. And so volatility, the reason I want to do volatility is the co is really uh, related to volatility. And then another thing is because right now, uh, people are talking about volatility anomalous. And so I chose size and volatility as a two factor to create portfolio. And volatility is still significant difference between high vol and low vol, okay? For one year, three year, five year, 10 year. And, but in the favorable one, still kind of mix. Sometimes, so this is uh, the, the chart, which we look at the difference between different factors one year, one to three year, one to five year, one to 10 year. And yeah, if you look at this, you know, the, the unfavorable for 10 year, is 46% different. And in the graph it show, sometimes you can reach to, that this is a mean, okay? But sometimes in the graph it show, like in the 208 can be 70% different. It's quite large. So in the size for unfavorable, the, this is different between large and small cap. And, but for favorable is mixed. And in a 10 year, actually the opposite. Large firm more likely to be acquired. And the uh, volatility is similar to size. And the volatility actually in the fight to 10 year, this range is uh, more favorable for low ball. Okay. Maggie? Yes. Have you tried estimating these, uh, these different uh, mortality rates uh, jointly? It, it, it seems like uh, the likelihood of default and likelihood of takeover kind of uh, interact in an interesting way. Like yes, in yes. Yeah, I, I was one of my, my students do next project is much more complicated is uh, create mortality rate in the joint. And we are working on it. I, I, he, he is not here right now, but we, we tried actually they, the, they are even right now, I have been surveying a couple of uh, paper. They are like a size volatility and then maybe leverage, leverage ratio. This is all very good for predict the mortality. And so joining, the, the only thing is how you join them, you know, and that's a trick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah it, it seems like a competing risk sort of like hazard model thing is, is, is sort of. Yeah, you can it. use the green black. Green black have a one of a two by two um, kind of, a, uh, you know, the high ball, also low, uh, uh, small cap. That's the worst. The kind of two by two graphic, you know, that, that could be a very good way to, to approach. But then I, I have a, in my mind, I have a three or four important factors. So I, I need to think about some way, maybe use some kind of, um, I come out with some kind of probability stuff, you know, I, I'm, but no, I'm still trying to think about what's the best way to do it. But you are right. If you join them, the, the you know, even better, I mean, the small cap high vol probably eighty percent will die in two years. <laughs> okay. So next thing, uh, what do we do is we look at what's the cause of the gap between uh, large cap, small cap, and high vol and low vol. Okay, and EPU is economic policy uncertainty. Uh, is developed by. Broom, Davis, Baker, okay. And um, one thing nice about we use EPU instead of VIX 
is if you go back to 1920s, so you have a much long time series because we use a long series of time to do uh, work on this paper. But I, I really need to say one thing about this EPU is uh, there's a two gentlemen in Goldman uh, use uh, the relationship between EPU and VIX, and they find 62% uh, of the EPU can be explained by one month is VIX. And the long-term VIX, like a one-year VIX, can explain 86%. So if you want to do this type of uh, study in a much shorter term, a VIX is easier. I always believe VIX. I love VIX, OK? So we try to look at this type of uh, uh, difference linked to market uncertainty. And the result is interesting is for 10 years, Okay, uh, for 10 years here, 10 years, EPU can explain 48% of uh, the difference between large and small cap mortality rate. Okay, and so we find EPU is pretty good explanation for this. The, what we do right now is a difference of okay? a different mortality between large and small and different mortality between high vol and low vol. I didn't do the direct uh, influence, but we just do the gap. And so uh, EPU tend to be pretty good explanation for the gap mortality between different group. So, the summary of uh, this paper is, um, how much time I have? Maybe I should go farther though. Okay. The, we, we break the com, uh, company valuation as a two, side, two core option. And then we use the size and volatility to examine the mortality. And what we find is this mortality uh, is, a. Uh, very, uh, the small cap and high volatility company tend to have a much higher mortality rate than large cap and low volatility company. And for the favor one, the, the result is kind of mixed. And, but the, for the, uh, this kind of difference can very easily explain by VIX or EPU, Economic Policy Uncertainty Index. This first paper, now go to the second, second paper. Second paper, uh, the paper already published. And the idea is, <clears throat> in the beginning, I talking about, uh, we use the expected time to ruin to value a company. And the model itself is the stochastic process, but one of the uh, implication we, we use, apply to the golden growth model. And basically is this, the price of company in the under expecting time to ruin, expecting different to expecting time to ruin is the company have a terminate date, okay? And in the golden gross model and then, and then perpetual DCF model, there is no terminate date. So under the expecting time to model, uh, golden gross model, uh, the value is equal to golden gross model minus a tail value. So like what I'm talking about, five years, they will be have 80% of value will be gone. So this will part will be that 80%, okay? But M, this M is a discount factor, okay? And ET is expecting time to ruin, okay? So give me, we know this, okay? So we come up with something called implied mortality. Implied mortality is giving this is correct. We assume price we can absorb in the market, and all these dividend, we average cost of capital, growth rate, all can absorb in the market except the ET. We don't know. So that what the terminate date is. That's why I call implied mortality. And implied mortality uh, you can solve will be equal to this. And this is based on golden growth model. And Tom and me, we all prefer use DCF, but DCF model is much complicated to solve because your growth rate is not constant and there's a whole bunch of assumption. So we use golden growth model to uh, show the result, but probably better is use the DCF model. So in, in the following 
uh, graphic, um, what I, I try to do is I, I put a lot of assumption. I know this assumption people probably don't like it, but just try to show uh, the result of implied mortality only. And so uh, what I assume is the dividend is equal to last 12 months average price times dividend yield 2%. Okay, the 2% is for SP 500, okay? And then average cost of capital is 8%, gross rate is 7%. And 8% is more risk premium uh, assumption and 7%, you need to something below 8%, okay? And what we do, try to look is a three crisis, okay? During the tax bubble financial crisis and the COVID-19, and because we, we as I mentioned, we work this paper in July, so the uh, summer, so July is the last point. So what we did is we graphed the implied mortality for most popular uh, couple of ETF, SPY, QQQ, L XLF. XLF is finance. So you can see uh, <clears throat> the red one is SPY, and then red one, uh, no, black one is SPY, red one is QQQ. Green one XLF. So you can see uh, in the tax bubble, tax go down a lot. So uh, tax implied mortality go down. So you know, and then the another two much better. And then in the finance crisis, uh, also interesting is in the COVID nineteen uh, finance go down most. Okay. And probably Bill can tell me that's because of the leverage effect. Yes, indeed. And so we, we calculate this during the crisis and we uh, look at these three index. And we also look uh, XLF, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and Citigroup. I should use the Credit Suisse too. Uh, but so you, you can see is the interesting is um, uh, Citigroup, usually doing the worst. And Goldman Sachs, when they recover, doing the best. And JP Morgan's kind of between. And this is a, a couple of retail, JC Penny, Walmart, Amazon. And you can tell in the beginning, uh, Amazon go down a lot because also compound with the tax bubble, but Amazon actually doing well in the COVID-19. And Walmart tend to be pretty stable and you'll know JCPenney go bankrupt. But JCPenney doing quite well in the uh, tax bubble. And one of my favorite stock, GE, and, and compared to uh, SP 500, and you can see uh, G because they also have a G capital, which kind of the, their financial ad, but they also have a problem. And so uh, G started doing worse during the financial crisis and because their G capital and then also their pension and and then coming down again in the COVID-19, but recovered somehow recently. So this is a graphic we, uh, the table we look at uh, all the um, ETF and the stock we mentioned. And it, we put uh, their mean and high, low and the range. And a couple of interesting thing here is, uh, SP 500 is about 70 years. And if people know this paper about the Schiller, uh, he used uh, use SPY and he think is a constant 100 years, 99 years, that's what he used. And QQQ and the, the also Citigroup during the, the finance bubble, was the lower can reach about five years. Um, I was in the trading for during that time and it was uh, quite scary for Citigroup because uh, he was, uh, uh, Citigroup was our prime broker and uh, we're quite, after Lehman, 
go bankrupt. And uh, we were really af afraid. And it was during the crisis, it go down to about 5% uh, by year. And the G recently go down to um, 19 a year. So all this is kind of, uh, um, no, because we have very simple assumption about dividend and then growth rate. But if you do much more uh, accurate forecast, I think result will be very similar like this. So basically the <clears throat> average in prime mortality is about 70 year, and, but it's no constant through time. During the crisis, we're because the price is dramatic move, because I use average price of last 12 months as dividend yield. So you, you can have a bigger impact. And in prime mortality, it's very different across the different stock. And Citigroup a standard deviation, uh, for example, Citigroup have a standard deviation of 21 years and JC Penney have a 30 year. These are the two worst ones. And during the tax bubble, Amazon only reached reach to 13 year and QQQ is 30 year. And that's the worst during the tax bubble. And during finance crisis, Citigroup and GE was the worst. This is all in our sample, okay? I've just picked a few stocks, not all of them. And Walmart and QQ is doing the best in the finance crisis. And during the COVID-19, JCPenney is a rich 12 year. Of course, JCPenney go bankrupt, okay? Citigroup also didn't do quite well. Uh, but Walmart and QQ is doing the best during the COVID-19. <clears throat> And in the total total period, Citigroup and JCPenney was the worst, and then Walmart and Spider was the best. So this is in terms of we estimate how long company or ETF will uh, survive. And this table, what we do is we look because uh, Shiller Shiller have a statement about uh, exuberant. Uh, irrational exuberant. And basically what he state is the volatility of SP500, I think it's return volatility of SP500 is way greater than earning volatility or dividend volatility. So if you look at golden growth model, you should say the volatility should be equal, okay? But he said because the return volatility of SP500 is way greater than um, the uh, dividend earning. So he claimed that's an uh, irrational exuberant. But what we say is there's a third possibility is because the mortality rate change, okay? So even SP500, okay, he used SP500 about 99 year, constant 99 year. But think about SP500 is a basket of the stock, okay? And just think about in the financial crisis, uh, the Lehman or the financial sector probably suffer a lot of the mortality rate. So in that case, the whole basket, even just assuming other sector doesn't change, the whole basket of the mortality should go down. So that's what we are looking at. In here, we're looking at the price volatility and price mean, return volatility, re return mean, and He's right. Return volatility is way larger than dividend volatility or earning volatility, like what he's talking in the book. But then there's a possibility is we use implied volatility, use price, so it's kind of um, you know, but can be caused by the underlying mortality change for the any basket of the stock. So we summary result that there's a mean of uh during event, the volatility SP 500 price dividend and EPS all go down during the event time. And volatility of implied uh, mortality go up from 7.54, no event to 11. So mean of a uh, typo, mean of SPY return dividend year earn, earning per share implied mortality all dec decrease during the event time and volatility of SPY return dividend year in prime or increase during the event time. 
So the end, not really the end. Any question? Um, <clears throat> can you just summarize um, where your research efforts are with respect to the model with both bankruptcy and acquisition? Right now, uh, I I like uh, basically basically this. Okay, I think a lot of uh, phenomenal, like a size effect, volatility effect, or some way link to mortality. And I think uh, my effort I try to do is probably my I'm. I like to look into a, this type of the argument rather than just, uh, uh, you know, just say sites doing well in certain times, sites didn't do well in a certain time. I rather look into what's really underlying um, price factor for cross section. Return. You, you might find you might find a, 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 a fundamental point of view as, as opposed to a mechanical point of view. Point yeah, I mean, the mechanical point of view, we, we, we did do uh, the FX hedging and valuation, but we haven't really combined everything together. And my, I mean, my experience over the time tell me the terrorists have been really underestimated in the market. And during crisis, it will magnify. And so our interest in this type of uh, research will be try to look more into about mortality type of the cross-section return errors. So you'd expect a connection say between credit default swap rates and volatilities then. And um, just say there is research that shows in fact, there are such connections. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, I have a, I have a quibble. A quibble is a very small thing that is doesn't have to be corrected, but bothers somebody and bothered me uh, because I was confused for about 10, 15 minutes of the paper by your use of the word mortality. Now I think a mortality is a probability of death, and but you seem to be using it throughout in terms of mortality is life expectancy, so higher. You know, better mortality is longer life expectancy, and and so I kept looking at your table and said, God, these numbers are, 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 are gigantic because I think it was there was supposed to be the probability of, of, of death over a period, but it was rather it was uh, the inverse of the probability is it was life expectancy in terms of years. So uh, you know, obviously the paper's been published uh, or will be published. I don't expect you to change all the wording in it. But just be aware that a lot of people, I should think, would interpret it the same way I would, unless you really explain it right up front. You mean, you mean implied mortality table? Yeah, well, implied mortality, I'm thinking mortality is a probability of death. But that's not what your table is. Your table is a life expectancy. Yeah, can we look at the table? This one? Well, just, just these pictures, right? Yeah. Oh, the terrible ones are, are the ones that are showing the lowest numbers. Yes. Why? But uh, uh, I, anyway, it's a quibble. Yeah. It's a quibble, but I was confused. And so I, I you know, suggest yeah, when it, you it, give the paper, it, make it real right. clarify. Mortality is, in, in our sense, is not the probability, but rather it's the length. Right. So it's like, like one yeah. over the probability. Yeah. Oh, unfortunately, the paper already published, so I can't. Yeah, yeah, you know, just, that's that's why it's a quibble. I don't expect yeah. you to change it. <laughs> yeah, we we thought about we tried to do a lot of a uh, uh, um a uh, name yeah. because we want to something. I am sounds very good. I know? see. Yeah, so I'll just say in statistics, there's a term called mean residual life, um, and that's actually I think what you're you're capturing with this. I am. Oh, so, how about implied life? Well, yeah. the you know, life expectancy. Yeah, so it's life expectancy. So I'm just saying, in you know, in statistics, especially like statistics. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I did. They've already thought about. It. 
terminology. Yeah, so <clears throat> that's the point out, but we didn't thought about it. We just tried to find some name which is, sounds um, easier to remember. <laughs> mm. I think there's an analogy uh, also going back to the the, the, the tides coming in and and and, and uh, um, the uh, when 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 you when have a tide in one direction only um, you, you change the direction of that and 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 you you're changing the whole model mm. but but. Uh, when you have two tides, tides, waves coming in at different angles, uh, that, that that provides a uh, it, it puts a damper on the on on the situation, and and uh, uh, it goes to a mathematics that, that we're more familiar with. Yeah, I think of Tom's point of view. We actually we debate a lot. We we go to the beach every morning, and then we see this tide. So when just think about, I mean, the way you think about it, the volatility is one tie, and then size is another tie, and they collapse. So, <laughs> so the, our, our thinking is probably try to look more detail, like uh, Peter talking about uh, credit swap. And uh, I, I try to look at more of uh, internal of pharma and French, uh, few factors, that type of approach. Uh, uh, more tied to the mortality. I mean, these two paper is a very small paper, and uh, but I think there are other a lot of potential to do a uh, much complicated model, and our goal is always uh, geared to um, how to price the stock, and. In addition to that is, uh, from my point of view, is how to tilt the portfolio. Okay. All right, um, we're um, out of time. So I wanna thank you uh, both Maggie and Tom for your talk today. Um, so uh, Abby, you can stop the recording. And um, yeah, I hope to see you all next week. Yeah, <laughs> like 